Welcome back again to Franchise Leaders Respond, Franchising Stronger Together. We're joined today by Britt Kennedy. Britt is CEO of Tough Mudder Bootcamp. Welcome to the call today, Britt. Thank you, Brad. Excited to have you on here. Your industry, buddy, has been hit. I don't got to tell you that. Um, before we jump right into to understanding Tough Mudder and how you've uh, been impacted, how about your family? How are you impacted? You're in the Charlotte area, I believe. Yes, sir. Uh, we've been very fortunate. Um, I, I live in a world where uh, my family's not been immediately impacted. I do have one exception that I'll, I'll mention briefly. Uh, my community as large um, has not been impacted, uh, but unfortunately we have the same things happening in cities that you find uh, on a smaller scale that you read about where uh, some of the poor areas um, have been impacted and we try to do things that we can to help that community through, um, I discussed uh, some blood drives we've done, some efforts to get out to some of the homeless to make sure uh, that they have some assistance in PPV and some other sanitation uh, materials. That's a big misstep. And that keeps us very well grounded in this setting, that if you're in the side of the world that has the ability to shelter at home, I'm one of those folks. Uh, the one exception is my sister did contract COVID. Uh, it was a very mild experience, so um, in some ways she was glad to have it behind her. I'm not sure that's everyone's mentality, uh, but it certainly does welcome something to say, hey, I was able to manage this very well, and it kind of makes it feel a little bit less scary when you know that someone close to you was able to go through it, barely uh, resulted in anything. She's a fitness person herself, so that's basically... Um, where we are. I do have a, a daughter at in university, and so she's now at home. I'm sure she's going stir crazy. I have a son who's in high school, and he's staying at home, so he's stir crazy, but generally we've been fared very well, so thank you. I see him uh, behind you there on the on the mantle. Yeah, sorry. This is my <laughs> office. I do have my Tough Mudder Boot Camp hat on, but I didn't I didn't feel like it would be too obvious to have a pennant behind me of Tough Mudder Boot Camp, so hopefully everyone remembers who I am. Well, I didn't even say I'm with IFPG in case anybody's wondering. Um, <laughs> well, it's nice how you're able to do that and you know where to put your hand. <laughs> I, I showed you this earlier. My, my, I cut up my hat to be a, uh, a little bit of a mask here, right. so I, I don't get to wear the hat anymore. Um, but we're having fun with it. Not to make light of a tough situation, doing our best to make it through together, franchising stronger together. Um, Tough Mudder Boot Camps, that is a very much a close proximity type of activity, I would think, right? Uh, it's been, my wife did a boot camp, a, a Tough Mudder, back in the day, and I have, I, I'm a virgin on the boot camp scene. Uh, help us understand, Tough Mudder Boot Camp, who are you, what you do, the size of your organization, and then we can talk more about the impact. Yes, so Tough Mudder Boot Camp, was born out of the national and international brand of Tough Mudder when uh, basically three and a half years ago, they realized that they were onto something in terms of not just brand culture identity, but community identity. And their mantra is tougher together, which is a great mantra even today. Uh, so if you see hashtag tougher together, you're going to either find us or Tough Mudder. They believe that one of the things within the studio fitness space that was tiptoeing around, uh, but not quite as well as they thought it could be done, is a group fitness uh, environment where it's highly functional fitness with great benefits we can talk about later. But within the experience, it was smartly done where human interactivity and community building would be more uh, prevalent. And what does that mean is we were very specific in designing the workouts to end after 45 minutes because we noticed that people like to chat for five or 10 versus being pushed out. Uh, we also felt the science at 45 was maximal. We would take the class size and uh, optimize it not to be just as many people you can cram in there. So our class sizes are 24 max anyway, in a very large space um, divided into six stations. So you would have pods of four people that you would be working out together with through the different stations of 12 movements or more. Um, under this notion that, hey, we can make functional fitness fun, we can make it effective, but we can make it together a la tougher together. And we've really seen and experienced that through our uh, offerings, but even today, uh, I'm sure every studio fitness has their core community, but what we have noticed is this thickness that 
they wanted to stay together in any way they could. So that's what we are. Size, uh, we basically have um, uh, six studios open today. We have three more that's scheduled to open today. And we have a backlog of another 30 uh, in terms of uh, the growth rate. Um, we opened our first uh, basically two years ago. Uh, well, I guess a year and a half ago. Well, what's today? May. So it was basically September 18. Uh, so we've actually seen a nice balanced growth. Uh, we have found that the brand attracts a ton of interest, uh, both from the Tough Mudder Nation. And if you think about that, particularly for an organization like yourselves, it's, it's a four and a half million person size participation base that we push out our information once a month to. Uh, and we have great alliance with Tough Mudder itself. My individual organization is uh, 12 wide. I've been very proud. I took the reins in June of last year. I, bought a 20, um, I brought in a 20 year marketing veteran. I bought in a, a 15 year operations veteran, VP of uh, franchise performance. And then most recently, what we're most proud of is uh, one of the early coaches who ran all of the fitness uh, program and they call them template managers out of Orange Theory joined us at the start of this year after diligencing us for several months comparing our product to other products and found that what we are saying to the world of fitness is different than the other products out there. So that's about the size of our franchise community and the team itself. Well, <clears throat> to further validate the brand strength, two years ago, I'm in a Dick Sporting Goods. I find the coolest looking shirt because I only wear cool shirts, as you can tell, uh, and Dick's Sporting Goods. <laughs> and I, it's just the right color, goes with my eyes, matches my shorts, you know, the whole deal, fits just right, very comfy, uh, sweat wicking, etc. I get it, wear it. It says Tough Mudder really big right here. So everybody, oh, you ran Tough Mudder? I, I, I constantly got to go, I'm just a fan, just a fan. Truth is, uh, I, I bought it because I love the shirt and Tough Mudder was just a bonus. It's, I feel kind of like the guy wearing the Ferrari hat that never owned a Ferrari. You know, I have not run a Tough Mudder. I really want to one day. But um, anyway, I'm a proponent of your brand because I got the Tough Mudder, you know, on the big right bicep there. Yeah, so it's funny you say that because uh, we are a young concept, which I was attracted to coming to the business. Why? Uh, the large concepts I personally find are, are hard to kind of create your own ecosystem scale and size. And I found this to be fairly unique that you could have a 10 year old brand that's very well known as a fitness concept. We can talk about things that are different or not, but a fitness concept and a young brand concept. So, and when we speak about the, you know, the franchisees that come to us, but the other thing I did not appreciate is when I interact with vendors like a merchandising company that wants to partner with us if i had just started brits fitness and i was six studios strong with the backlog i don't think they would you know talk to me as much but we get a ton of inbound from the largest crms to the largest uh, retail providers in this environment uh, a lot of the uh, streaming services that want to partner with us etc so we have benefited from an organization by having the weight of a as a, of a national brand, even though we're young and uh, development schedule. Brand recognition is, is very strong for you guys. And that helps no doubt in the franchise space, both acquiring new franchisees and acquiring new clients. So how reliant are you on the brick and mortar part of your, uh, it's, you're normally brick and mortar, right? They go inside. Okay. So how, how, ha how have you been impacted, Britt? Well, we are brick and mortar. We are competing in the studio fitness space. Um, and when we get to what we're probably, when you'll, if you ask about the, the reopening, but <clears throat> so we, we are like many others, not just studio fitness, but the world that we operate in that involves coming into a physical location. So all of retail, restaurants, et cetera, we've all wrestled with that. Uh, and for restaurants, they tried to, and were able to, in many ways, pivot to takeout. Well, we as an industry had to do the same thing. And here's what we found that was at least true for us. Uh, fortunately, I talked about the strength of the team that we had. And that strength of team, it kind of, in my mind, transcends. See if I can say it to you this way. People aren't showing up to our studio just because it's a physical location. So there has to be something 
in that studio that requires or that attracts people. And we believe one of that is our programming and our discipline. Well, what's unique about the boot camp type workouts, and particularly IRS, it's functional fitness. What does that mean? It's body weight focused. We do have boxes, we do have dumbbells, we do have kettlebells, but at its core, it's our belief that we weren't born with barbells or treadmills or we were born to move our bodies this way. Science has made us effective that way. And so through that, we were able to create programming offers. That's our version of takeout. And you've probably seen it through all of fitness, wrestling with this. How do we continue to provide a service? So we move very quickly and launch what's called TNB at home. Second thing I learned was the online business has been around for decades and has gotten better and better um, along the way. Peloton, for instance, has done a fantastic job as it relates to their own personal experience. But it's somewhat of it is white noise. What, what does that mean? If you're not attached to a particular studio and you're figuring out, well, my gym is closed, my YMCA, et cetera, and you'll go through your own discs that you used to have from P90X or whatever, but you'll also notice that content is constantly being sent your way. Just Google online training and it's white noise and some of it's very good production. But what that noise can't compete with is the people that did go to their studios. What they were craving was their community and who they cared about were their coaches. So our belief at, uh, at Tough Mudder Boot Camp was first, we care about our customers and quite frankly when i think about my business model i have a very romantic side that we care about people that work in the franchises that they can be successful and grow and we care about our coaches so we move quickly in making sure the coaches knew that we want to make them successful and give them tools that they can communicate to their people and so our tough motor boot camp at home is basically a live streaming uh, platform with centralized programming from one of the smartest people in the world who I mentioned joined us. And we push it out and it comes out as live stream content where it's zoomed, et cetera. It has a written version. So if you want to you know, print it out for the week and have your training, it has many, when I say many, tiny challenges throughout the week, which could be a 30 minute challenge that pops up in nutrition. What we found is um, that was more valuable than us trying to create a production value that competes with the in-studio production. That was our big focus. So uh, we have found the majority of our customers engaged and we also found that they wanted to support us. And our only hesitation was, how do you monetize that in a world that we know is challenging? So we took the proactive approach was to immediately pause everyone, show them this product, and let them choose to put the value of it, which was basically a $50 value per month, and let them opt back in. And we saw the majority of the people return through that offer. What had they been paying per month? Uh, our, you know, we're similar to most of the studio fitness. So it's in the 159, 169 range for unlimited. Got it. So the franchisees, uh, although not a huge number open, they all closed the physical locations, they said to all their current clients, we're going online, no charge at the moment. You tell me what the value is and you've reached a consensus that the, the vast majority have stayed on at a $50 per month. Correct, which is basically a, if you think about it, it's, it's a maintenance level because you're still planning to reopen. Um, but, as, as I'm thinking, if I'm thinking of your audience, what I'm trying to convey is we were overwhelmingly surprised how much the thought of tougher together community and tribe really did mean something to people that were coming to our studios. So the first thing that happened was people didn't want to turn off their memberships. They loved their local owners and they loved their coaches. And our coaches loved them, so they didn't want to keep taking their money. So we had to create a value proposition that could meet where we thought it was fair on both sides. And that's what became Tough Mudder Boot Camp at home. Outstanding. Wow. Okay. So you as that franchisor, seeing all this happen, how did you help them put this whole plan together, communicate yeah. with them, organize it, disseminate it? How did that happen? Well, first, obviously, you have to have level set call of 
you know, the, the world just changed. What does that mean? What is it we can do, et cetera? Uh, and we, we, you know, given it was staggering uh, a bit, we had a little bit of a head time, but the good thing about our business model, uh, which is not unique, but I, I hopefully believe that it's one of our strengths is our delivery of our, our programming is already digitally based. What does that mean? If you came into a Tough Hunter Bootcamp studio, I told you it's a very large footprint, but it has eight TVs. Each TV has two movements going on it so that you can do uh, multiple movements. That is something we already distribute through centralized programming down to a studio, right? So that technology already exists that we could just distribute it where it's just the video of the movements and the workouts built in. So we immediately distributed that as well as a written program that went along with that. We shifted from there in creating programming that was specific to at home. That took us about a week to do. And then we had to start training them on what is proper Zoom procedures, what are best practices on how do you schedule it? How does our CRM do, do the booking? But our primary, our primary uh, assistance is centralized programming that works at home. And these are good workouts. This is not slack together. I'm telling you, we have the best fitness programmer and she, you know, she obviously coached, you know, 1800 coaches, et cetera. Very, very strong asset. Her name's Caitlin. <clears throat> So we program it centrally. And then she has calls with the coaches on regular intervals that before the program comes out, she says, here is this week's program. And she focuses on the what, how, and why we do something so that when the coaches zoom in, they can talk to their consumers. And we want, our goal is to make each of our, if you think about everything you've learned about Studio Fitness, would you not say one of the strengths are the coaches that are rock stars are successful? That is our goal. And what's funny is because of the world that we live in, the coaches are even hungrier for the knowledge. Like when things are busy and you have these coaches call, you're not, you're on, you know, you're on a phone or now we are coaching them to be rock stars on their own video experience so that they succeed. And then obviously the owners succeed. With the with the coaches being successful through their their zone, their zone. well, they've really created process. with your guidance. They've created a tribe. You know, this brand virtual is that training. the local tribe, that local virtual training, whether it's in person or virtual, it's right. still that Sorry, tribe. We did create a tribe. The tribe is very loyal, yeah. and they miss each other. They see each other. We just had an event where we created a virtual. Uh, race uh, as a side project where people won medals, et cetera. It, it manifests itself in many different ways. I, I, I'm reminded of Cheers, the TV show. Everybody knows your name. You go in and you can't wait to, you know, it's, it's, like, the, same, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's like, like your, your little Sunday school class. Yeah. You know? Well, here's uh, an example. What would be the best practice if your studio closed because of COVID? What would be the best, the best practice, practice? would be before you even had program. Your best practice is for you to have a human outreach. Like someone calls you red and says, Hey red. And you say, Oh, well, Hey Brit, how are you? Great. It's good to see you. How are you doing? How's your family doing? They go fine. How are you doing? Well, it's crazy. Hey, we're going to be launching this online programming thing. Curious if you're interested and you maintain that dialogue. Well, what we're coming to is a different phase is there's going to be a level of trust between you that we're thinking of you. And then we move into the pre-opening phases and the other phases. This is a real relationship. If you go to a gym and you can't call and talk to someone because they're closed down, then you can tell that they're about running a business and not building a community. Amen. You know, when this all hit uh, my team, we were a membership organization. We had folks uh, in process, be looking to become a member or not. And I had the development, the membership folks um, say, you call every one of them and do not mention membership. You check on them as a person. And then on my operations team, we do the same thing. Call every member and check on them. Now in doing that, we actually had some, some have, you know, need to bring up something negative to us about membership or what have you or cash flow. And they probably wouldn't have done that had we not called them, but it didn't matter. We doing what's right which is caring for people. When you do what's right, the bigger picture takes care of itself every time. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
So that's a great takeaway for franchisors, doing what's right and not being so concerned about the short-term bottom line, but be caring about the people. They won't forget it. Um, so what about the coming back to reality to, the, to as new norm as we can get? What does that look like for Tough Mudder Boot Camp? Yeah. <clears throat> so first, I'll talk about what, what is going on in studio, since that's the real question everyone's asking. Uh, and then I'll talk about going back to your takeaway, which is what is right, what is right for our staff, what is right for the consumers. So the in-studio, we, uh, one of the reasons I've always loved uh, the Tough Mudder uh, boot camp concept is when I look at it from a business standpoint, so remember, uh, I don't know if I gave you my background, I ran uh, what I call middle market leverage finance for 18 years, where we analyzed companies and diligence them and helped them finance and buy. You would look at things that you would test against unvar variables, like what is it you know that makes your financial model collapse, et cetera. So in fitness, uh, when I looked at it and I looked at different concepts, what I liked about our footprint was it's versatile. It's so versatile that on a dime, I can change if fitness trends change, et cetera. It's wide open, it's versatile. Well, what I didn't know was it also benefits from this world where social distancing, it might be an ingrained protocol for an inner period of time. What does that mean? As I mentioned, I've got six stations with two, two things typically happening. Each station is 300 square feet of space. I can immediately create 10 by 10, 100 hundreds, or eight by eights, or even 120 spots. Two is we are functional fitness based. So we already have a huge library of movements that are centered around things we already do. The hard part is we used to rotate through. So in the interim stages, we have basically these workout zones uh, with centralized programming. And obviously we have protocols around sanitation, things that make the consumer feel, uh, um, for lack of a better word, as best possible. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic, I'll, I'll segue. If you're coming back into studio fitness in this first phase, my sense is you probably have a confidence on your own health risk, and you're probably willing to do more than what we're even providing. But we do wanna maintain this notion that we never will know the individual comfort of one person, either your staff or someone else. Uh, sometimes people are afraid to speak out. So we have been very deliberate for weeks. I analyzed every state guideline we created a 70 page deck that went through um, all the preparations. And then we would have two hour one-on-ones with each studio to walk them through. And we did have three studios already open. Uh, so there's protocols on queuing, et cetera. I mean, what's interesting, Red, is when you think about it, it's not just the zones. You have to think through how does someone, if they have to leave class early, exit without crossing someone else's zone. You have to think about things of what if, what if someone collapses from exhaustion? What's the protocol for your staff? How do you manage those things? So uh, the studio fitness uh, arena in many ways is, is not that different than what we used to. It's just our class sizes are smaller and they're gonna be put in zones. But back to your takeaway, doing what's right uh, and picking up on my, I can never know the individual comfort of a client or a staff member. I need to make sure that it is not viewed as their only choice. What does that mean? Well, I just spent a lot of money and effort around creating TMB at home. That has to be an option, right? That you can choose both as a coach and a client to coach at home and you receive the product at home. Uh, the second prong is, which is again, very beneficial to us, functional fitness, is creating a interim zone which also is fitness in a social distance park you may me feel more comfortable if i need to get out and get air going into a studio hey come check out we're going to run this many classes a week the same program centralized programming that's happening in the studio in the park and at home because we have that privilege to do that so we have a three-pronged approach and those and will continue those will continue. We'll continue. Yeah, this to me has to become a reality until we think the world is different. I don't know how you can get to a place that says the consumer does not want that option. And then we have a bonus prong that says this one message, because envision this, if I'm telling the, the trainer or the coach, the owners, what are your best practices? What are your best practices? Talk to your members. 
one off and then imagine a group call like this let's say you're on them and you're talking to them these are our plans and you're going through all those steps where you're trying to convey is we want to come where it's most comfortable for you we value you not trying to force you into a studio and here's our options and then i end it with this and i say furthermore you have your own world that you're safe in right now maybe it's your family maybe there's a small knit of folks that that's who you're most comfortable with the bonus option is here's a schedule for all of the slots that you can just book your class privately just you're an unlimited member you pick your friends and family if it's five people come in that's the entire class and we call that the off calendar option but it's basically saying my first entryway is I need to get exercise. My husband and I need to get exercise. My son and I need to get exercise. And I've actually started social distancing with my neighbor. I would like to book the 10 o'clock, just five people, fine, it's just five people. We'll stop it, we'll cap it there. Because we need, we need to give them options that um, provide them a crossway that also improves the utilization of our, uh, of our studio. So that will create some some utilization uh, in the off hours. So, so Rob, I heard off calendar, park. Um, at home. Uh, at home, thank you. And then in studio, for lack yep. of a better word, studio. Or was it only studio before? Did you add three more significant options for clients? We did, but if you wow. think about it, from us, we have centralized programming, so we don't have to do anything different on distributing it down to the studio. Two is if you think about how a studio operates and you used to have 10 classes a day, you'd have to have 10 coaches doing something. Maybe now you can at least have six coaches doing something. One can be doing one at home during the morning. Maybe you can have one doing two or so in the afternoon. So it really doesn't change the workload, but we can add value to the consumer so that our util So if you are evaluating, I'm turning on your membership. Let's just think about it. You're, you're you. And I'm your, I'm your coach, you love me, you love, but you're trying to figure this out as well. And I say, hey, we're gonna turn on your membership on this day. And you go, I don't know how many times I'm gonna come, et cetera, and I go, okay. First is, if you don't wanna do any of that, continue to pay $49 a month, and we'll give you two free passes, come check it out. Okay, then you start going there, okay, I don't know what the world's gonna look like. Maybe it shuts down, maybe it reopens, maybe it shuts down. You may have more confidence in paying the full membership fee where you know that we've already thought through several options one is at home okay that's a check the box oh in the park i can't imagine that they're going to shut down the parks as quickly it's going to be spaced out oh and also i can't imagine that they're not going to give me the ability to social distance i mean uh, work out with my family i like that private option that's a pretty good value proposition and our cost structure really hasn't changed. We are still having a coach teach a class where the programming is sent down from corporate headquarters. And how have your franchisees responded to these? Wonderfully. Crazy well, well, cool. First of all, first of all, this past weekend was the first quote reopening. But yes, everyone, everyone loves their coaches and their community. And they love the fact that we care about giving them options to meet those crossroads and those options seem to art to many of them have already thought through this themselves like if you're a small business owner in texas where you are you know that that state seems to be on average more relaxed than others so you've already Amen. been thinking through how do i open up so our our texas location was on the exact same page which is I think I'm going to open first with boot camps in the park just to see how my members react, you know, and so they, it's a very natural, it's a very natural iteration. I think everyone also knows that if you ignore the at home option, you could lose someone permanently that was willing to hang on with you for two more months when their comfort gets higher. Yep. And, and what a, what a great time to do something in the park. <laughs> I mean, this, oh, yeah. <laughs> this time of year. All right. So we know, you never sell another franchise. You will never award another great franchise if you don't have validations high. That's key. You obviously are focusing on what matters, taking care of your current franchise family. Validations will follow. Um, let's talk franchise development. Two parts to it. Well, uh, first part is 
the folks that were in pipeline when the everything hit the fan what's happened to them how have that how they have all transitioned or they pause close disappear and then we'll talk new pipeline yeah so fortunately the world well i guess i guess you don't say fortunately <laughs> the fact that the world froze at the same time basically gives each person some power what i mean by that is if uh a subset of America was going through a hard time and you're dealing with a landlord and or a lender, you don't have much of a voice. With the world going through this all at one time, our job was to provide information to our franchisees that enabled them to feel strong. Like, because this is a scary time, how do you feel strong? You bring them information. If I tell them 20% of all rent went to a landlord in April, then you might feel yourself maybe I shouldn't have paid rent or not, right? Because the landlords are frozen. So it encourages them. And we did have a, uh, an attorney that um, we centralized uh, a call, offered up for free advice, et cetera. We also did the same thing with insurance, centralized insurance, where you can make sure if you had questions on either business interruption or liabilities, et cetera. Um, and so we tried to centralize as much as we can to give them strength to do what they needed to do. And what that was, was engage in productive conversations with your landlord. So what does that mean? We have three studios in the process of opening. You have the call and say, we can't open. I need this much time to reevaluate. And uh, fortunately, uh, the landlords know that they uh, need to be friendly to this because what they can't do is really find someone to replace anyone. They really can't take power in forcing an eviction and politically. I mean, maybe they care or don't care, but I personally think politically they would be at risk of, of being exposed to, oh, I just shut down these people during COVID. So the first thing we did was educate them on all their options, give them information so they can have power to talk to their lenders. The good thing is if they had SBA, SBA was already on top of it. They already have a ton of political pressure and they say, hey, we're gonna take care of you for the rest of the year and we just need to align uh, the, uh, the rental space. And so basically we've been very fortunate that everything is being delayed to a future period of time. The risk that exists for all of us, you, me, and anyone is, does that period of time shift is that we get, we get surprised? If so, then we have to revisit those conversations. But we've been very fortunate that we believe that we've pushed into the fall, all of our openings, that gives them the power uh, to open in better circumstances. Fantastic. So did you see a change in, in uh, you know, what is your investment level? What's your item seven investment range approximately? And then did you see a change uh, in yeah. how... If I answer that wrong, did I break the law? Uh, you do not. Yeah. Hey, Dan Henry's wonderful. He's going to be watching and cracking the whip on you if you don't get right, that I'm answer right. I'm saying that uh, <laughs> I'm going to get it wrong, but I feel like it's... Uh, uh, mid to high twos to uh, mid fours. Um, yeah. That the primary driver is that is uh, square footage and the state. Uh, we assume a certain development uh, level based on national contracting, but that's the range. Yep. Uh, um, so what about that new pipeline? Have you seen it pick up, slow down, uh, stay the same where we at on that? Uh, we have a pretty uh, robust pipeline. I would tell you the disadvantage, and I'm sure this is shared with all my peers, uh, is, um, well, let me take a pause. My strategic focus prior to the uh, COVID and uh, my continual focus during COVID and after was, I was mostly interested in well-experienced, what I would call the empire builders or investors, people that were business-focused, if they had uh, physical fitness enthusiasm in them, that's wonderful, but that's not the driver. And so those types of uh, investors are savvy enough to know uh, there's a time for reflection, to learn, and that's the phase they're going into. But we're starting to see the reemergence of that investor that knows that the timing of this could be fairly opportunistic. And why is that? If you're a business investor and you kind of have a view on the economy, then you know that you have to, there's gonna be a window and that window has a certain lifespan. Maybe it's six months, maybe it's nine months, but that lifespan suggests 
that maybe in the fall, you're gonna start seeing retail weakness. Landlords will lose people along the way. And we already had a problem that why, why was fitness, why was fitness such an attraction in general? Uh, I know you sell a lot of different, or you work with a lot of different franchises, but what is it unique about fitness? Well, one of the things is demographically it grows. Studio fitness is growing 12 times faster than general fitness. And we know that it fits a need that's missing as retail is collapsing because of Amazon. Coming out of the cycle, that's going to be accentuated, I believe, from cafeteria, I mean, from cafes to restaurants to small retail stores. So the smart investors, if they believe with conviction that fitness is here to stay, and they believe with conviction that studio fitness, this community is real, then now is the time to start beginning the conversation so we can get rewarded and begin the real estate in the fall. The fall is where it's gonna start. It takes a while, because right now the landlords are frozen, they're not gonna drop rates, so we're gonna come into the fall. So unfortunately, there was a pause in decisions that were ready to hit, to reflect and understand what's happening. And now it's beginning a conversation that says this might be the time to play big. The smaller investors are oddly different mindset. I think they have a more traditional optimistic view. And that optimistic view says, I like fitness. I want to run my own business. The world's going to get better. And so the smaller players have remained very interested along the way um, uh, through this process. Not high as number because their own individual lives are impacted, but that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the reemergence of what we call the serious investors, not in decision-making, but engaging. And we've seen a smaller, but still active, smaller buyer or subset. I'm and, curious, and, if, have you and, found that to be the case as well? Or? We have, we've, we've seen a lot of the, uh, I've been, you know, a few of these interviews and have heard quite a bit of the folks with a lower risk tolerance, excuse me, higher risk tolerance. They're not, they're not as freaked out as most, right? And a stronger balance sheet. Yes. Those guys are who are jumping in now, moving forward, not afraid of a decision, understand we're going to be okay, and also understand the timing of the market is strong. I've, I've probably had four different franchisors quote Warren Buffett, you know, <laughs> you buy when no one else is buying and you sell whenever, you know. And so um, I've heard that theme often. Um, I've also heard a theme, and we've experienced this greatly here. We have a sister company, Career Transition Leads, that uh, provides leads for the industry. And uh, they have seen a, a considerable uptick in interest because of the poor job market. Poor job market, uh, the good job market, when everybody's getting the job they want, has been the biggest enemy to many franchisors losing deals left and right to that awesome candidate getting that dream job that they didn't think they could get. Ain't happening anymore. And so we're seeing a huge uh, influx of folks interested in, okay, it's time to reevaluate and look at it again. Or, man, what are my options? Franchising might be one. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, in this conversation, you've used the word coach quite a bit, Britt. Um, Typically, correct me if I'm wrong, typically the coach is an employee of the, of, okay, and you've got some semi-absentee owners. Maybe they even have a three-pack and they're overseeing three different coach groups. Okay. Good. Yeah. So um, I don't know how I've used the word coach, but um, I, I have a view that typically runs like this. Uh, the owner-operator model can be very successful. That is obviously everyone's optimal dream. Um, but <clears throat> I believe that this, if you have visions of empire building, um, having a general manager is going to be a key part of that success so you can expand it. But outside of that decision, studio fitness is about inter, um, interactivity, uh, interconnection, people, and you can be the, the technically most sound uh, physical trainer there is, but if you cannot connect to people, you are less valuable than someone who is not technically as sound because we give you programming. We have videos on everything. And there are people that come in and to say, I miss so-and-so. They make me feel good every day. And that's part of, I think, our franchisee success and our goal to help franchisees succeed is I believe it's part of our job. We take it personally that those coaches know that we are investing in them just as much as the franchisees because the coaches need to feel a part of something and we're trying to teach them how to be rock stars. So I don't, I don't know if that was tied into what I was saying, but that's, that is a big mantra to us. Yeah, I love it. Just, yeah. 
I love that message. And that's what we try to teach our kids, right? You need to be well liked, communicate well, eye contact, smile, make people feel welcome in any role. I mean, you look at it with 570 franchise consultants here at IFPG. We've got some that are the most intelligent, know the market inside and out, and read the balance sheets. They don't do quite as well as those who are just freaking friendly. Yeah. You, you lack him, you trust him, you uh, or her, you appreciate them, and you want to do business with them. That's what you need in a great coach, a great franchisee, a great consultant, a great advisor, um, a great CEO. Hey, um, so <laughs> we're wrapping up here, brother. Uh, you've been very helpful. Great insights too. Uh, any other, uh, you know, stories of triumph? Any predictions? Anything else to share with franchisors out there? Um, share with franchisors. So people like me out there doing it. Uh, I would say that um, the one thing that during this period of time that I uh, anchor myself by, and I'm, I'm, I'm not prone to quoting Warren Buffett. The only reason I'm thinking of Warren Buffett is because you mentioned him. <laughs> but it is this underlying uh, optimism around uh, American uh, capitalism, American resilience and perseverance and American ingenuity. And for franchisors, I view that if we are living in the world of a franchisor, what is the one thing that kind of makes you feel good? Obviously, making money and successful and those things, I'm not going to hide behind. I want to be big and successful and, and mark my own uh, path in life. But aren't we trying to bring that ability for people to be successful that maybe haven't found it on their own way? The idea that someone can own a business and they don't have the tools to do that. And I believe that through this, as you mentioned, through all recessions, et cetera, there are people that want to find that. And I think as franchisors, let's keep that optimism that when people speak to us, that we have the tools that they can create their own business, their own success on their own terms. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people be successful um, in their own way. Well, it sounds like you're providing it well, that American dream and providing the support. You have your priorities right, supporting your current franchisees, and ultimately that'll yield a whole bunch more great franchisees like them. Uh, Britt Kennedy, thank you for being uh, a friend to the franchise community, sharing best practices from Tough Mudder Boot Camp, and I hope to see you on the road in person real, real soon. Thanks again, Britt. Red, thank you very much for having me. Good luck. Thank you.